Um, okay, focal point for the school, center of the building, this atrium, that's where you pull it off. You, you really design the entry of the school and the entry of the library as having a shared entry and also separate. And the reason for that is if, a, if the library is used on the weekends but the main core of the school isn't, then you would want a separate set of, in addition to fire escape, you'd want an additional set of entrances. However, if the theater and the multimedia center shared that atrium, then all of a sudden you can, you can really look at that atrium as being creating a really elegant professional transition into spaces, but it also can be breakout space. And the big issue I always have um, with grand atriums is they serve one purpose. It's basically transition space, um, and maybe it ends up being a place like during an intermission. But the idea that it could be breakable, I love this idea of a, a set of, of, of seating out in the atrium. And here's what I would almost imagine if I move into the design. How could there be a big uh, um, a, 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 a wall, what we'd call a curtain wall, or a massive window, if you could imagine, between that seating in the atrium and into the library? And what I'm almost imagining is, imagine if you could have like a massive garage door that would raise and lower so that it was, it was transferable as far as light and visual, but it could be shut down. But all of a sudden, then the library, the media center could become bigger and what would be atrium sitting for kids at different times of the day or in between performances, et cetera, could now become an extension of the library if that big kind of garage door or glass garage door went up. Um, there, there are obviously issues with any solution, but it's a way of looking at not one space next to a space, but a, a big space that can be divided very quickly in multiple ways. And often we don't think of those walls between atriums and libraries as being adjustable. We look at the furniture on either side of that wall as being adjustable, not to say the walls themselves. So I really like this idea of a centering arrangement between the theater, between the multimedia library, and an atrium. I think there's something really lovely about that. And what happens at that point is all of a sudden you start to expand to, is this school simply a school or is it a hub for the community at large? And there's a couple of really interesting schools um, around the country that have really designed the schools or redesigned the schools as intersections for the community. You might attach a YMCA or a, a youth center or a community theater or a bunch of businesses that share an atrium, like entrepreneurial innovation hubs, or you might have a senior center down the hall from a high school. And so I really like this idea of what happens if we see that atrium as shared community and it having multiple purposes, including it being a learning space throughout the day, it being a teachable presentation space. Um, so uh, let's see, outside scenes, we got that cover. High, a, a lot of varieties of ceiling heights. I really love that. I, I think uh, there's no doubt that um, libraries, newer libraries tend to get a lot of attention in terms of daylight and windows and ceiling heights and, and different kind of vertical zones. Um, so I don't think that's hard. If you were to sit down with architects and they would give you some run to room, uh, a room to run in, I think they'd be okay. So that, I think that's good thinking. Bookshelves. I, I think we, you know, back in the day, in fact, in most places, there's still kind of a, a, a percentage that architects use when they work with, um, the state kind of what we call the educational specifications or the ed specs. And that's basically what the state says. If you have a library of so many kids, you have to have so much square foot or a percentage dedicated to storage or books. And it's, it's, they try to imagine a zone that's books and a zone that's kind of desks. And, and this is before Wi-Fi and, and third spaces and all this stuff. So it becomes interesting if we start, we, we start to ask the question of how many kids really check books out when they go to the library versus books being presented to them that can be checked out. And I think when librarians and teachers start to see themselves as brand agents or advertisers for books, um, you don't necessarily need to have 80 to 100% of your books visible when a kid walks in the library. I also think for younger library, li library users that the idea of, of bookshelves being taller than they are is counterintuitive to kids using those shelves. And I think the idea of a kid being able to see over or at least feeling like it's not that much higher prevents, frankly, a third grader from being nervous of going down a big row of books. And um, it's also sight lines for the adults. So I think lower shelves. Um, what I would do is I wouldn't go to an either or where all the bookshelves have to be on the external walls or to the outside. But what I would do is say that if you're going to put shelves in the middle, how does that create zoned activity zones or usage zones? And how can it sort of take a grand space, 
and divide it up into more kid scale or small group scale spaces. So again, let's go back to that two for one deal. So it's not an all or nothing. It's just if we have them in the center, how can that create paths? How can that create zones? How can that minimize height, uh, which intimidates younger users? Um, but I like the idea that we're not making the book the center of the library, but it's the activity and the collaboration is the center of the library. And then books become resources as opposed to a, a museum of books. They become resources within. Um, so I, I applaud that. Laptop carts, smart boards, and even rolling whiteboards. Like just something simple so a kid can, and a teacher can just scribble onto a board. I think not everything has to be smart board. Most teachers, frankly, don't know how to use them. And they get about 3% out of the investment. You know, they do basic touches, basic movement. They basically use it as a whiteboard that's dressed up. So... I think smart boards, how should I say this? And I don't take anything away from any of your personal experiences. On average, when administrators and the folks who buy technology, when they think, oh, let's be forward thinking, they immediately think smart boards. The problem is very few people use smart boards in robust ways, and it tends to be a very expensive purchase for modest outcomes. However, everyone knows how to use Post-it notes and whiteboards. So I think if you can imagine a, 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 a variety of smart boards, smart technology, and old-fashioned, non-digital white spaces that can move and, and, and be used quick and dirty on the fly, um, I would say you'll, you'll get a lot of bang for the buck. And you can suddenly create almost enclosed spaces, or at least trick the eye, sort of play gestalt, if you would. So you don't actually wall off an entire square, but you sort of put pieces in different areas and it to the eye it creates an enclosed space and and that's I think lovely um, comfortable chairs bravo love you on that um, I, I think kids also use benches if you can see benches or built-ins that are a variety of heights and quirkier spaces um, kids love that they love to nestle in the areas they like to perch and I think in addition to bean bags and soft seating and you know almost like a sunken living room approach in the 70s and 60s if you can think of like mounted um, different height benches and different height perches, um, I think you can create some interesting things there. A lot of elementary classrooms will have lofts, and it would be interesting if libraries had lofts also, reading nooks and reading lofts. But I love this idea of comfortable, and a lot of architects, what they will say is soft seating versus hard seating, but they mean comfortable. So the word comfortable is perfectly as applicable, but often soft seating is what they will they'll use when they think in terms of cushions, etc. Conference room, I, I love the idea of a concert, conference room. I would love for it to be at the center as long as it's all glass walls or it's completely visual um, because what you don't want to do is have a big space that has this big bulk in the middle and essentially what could have been a grand library and adjusted in many ways simply becomes a series of hallways around um, a big space. What I also like, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume something here, I, I, I would like to think that you could build in a professional development center or a digital virtual classroom for kids who say, um, you know, maybe there are kids around the country, maybe there are teachers around the world who could tap in, and it was really outfitted for really lovely, high-level production, high-level conference, high-level presentation. But it also becomes a lovely agent for the community. So if you needed a school board meeting, if you needed, um, you were going to have an outside speaker, you needed to bring in the community to talk about how the library was going to be used or, or designing the new football stadium or whatever. But you need one space that's human scale but very professional. And I would definitely argue that it would be a professional development center within the media center or within. That way, not only do adults use it, but kids start to talk in terms of professional extension of what they know and presentation, etc. So love that idea. And I would just extend, I would really explore the idea of what a conference room can be um, if it becomes the hub of a library or it becomes the intersection for global interaction as well as community interaction. Uh, computer labs, you know, I, I think we just got to get to the point where, you know, do we need computer labs the way we've always imagined or does it become different spaces where things like, I, you know, iPads, eBooks, Kindles, uh, iPods, etc., are available, or is it a thing where it's testing or keyboarding or computer skills? Is it the kind of thing where it's like at the end of the school day, adults come in that have never used computers, and you know it's a way to teach parents and teach community members how to be digitally 
uh, active, et cetera. So, you know, I think what we, again, just like conference room and just like library slash media, what do we mean by computer lab? You guys could spend the next hour just designing the computer lab within the library and arguing why its physicality and spatial relationship and how it looks to the outside, uh, outside of that space, uh, you could do that. But I would, I would explore what you mean by computer lab so it's not just a, the iconic idea of one. And that sounds strange. It's only been around for 10 or 15 years. But, you know, I haven't been to many schools that, that look different when they have a computer lab. They all look the same. Um, it might be a newer laptop, a newer desktop versus an older one, but they're essentially arranged. So those are, those are elements that strike